Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Catherine Hepburn was one of the biggest stars of the golden age of Hollywood. Through a career spanning six decades, 44 feature films, 33 theatre appearances and four Academy Awards, Hepburn's contribution to the arts, as well as her feminist outlook and her lifestyle choices, make her one of the most intriguing and admirable stars of the 20th century. What traumatised Catherine Hepburn for the rest of her life? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Occasionally confused with Audrey Hepburn of both the same era and profession, Catherine had a unique impact on the film industry through her strong will and stronger opinions, her feminism and her individually styled presence on the big screen. Her feminist viewpoints and bold presence in the press contrasted with the typical glamour of other stars of the time and created an ambiguous relationship between Hepburn and cinema audiences, as well as with critics and the media. Her rise to stardom did not come easily. However, her perseverance on her career path to the top has made her a long-lasting cinema classic and style icon. There's the proud tilt of her chin, the direct line of her posture, the graceful sweep of her hair, the steely eyes, the delicately strong cheekbones, the beautifully set mouth, and when she opens that mouth it only gets better as her high melodic voice runs circles around whomever or whatever stands in front of her. For millions, Hepburn was proof positive that Hollywood stardom wasn't all peroxide blonde and vapid size. Along with Betty Davis and Joan Crawford, Hepburn suggested that intelligence and verve were beautiful, and that people would pay to watch these beauties go head-to-head -head with their male co-stars. Hepburn broke all sorts of unspoken rules. She was an unabashed snob, and her voice rang with the sort of class that people outside New England loved to hate. She insisted on cold showers as a sign of character, she insisted on doing her own stunts because the stunt woman never stood up straight enough, and she revelled in her Yankee austerity. Her hair was red and untamable, and she wore trousers in private and public, pissing off the studio publicity heads who worked so hard to craft an image, any image, besides stuck-up tomboy. In other words, she was awesome. She hated Hollywood but loved movies, hated the process but loved the product. Because of her stubbornness, her star image became a rounded corners version of her off-screen self, one that played up her independent streak and the private romances that she seemed to mirror the tornado-like courtships she engaged in on-screen. During her career, Hepburn went from being one of the hottest new talents in Hollywood to being box office poison but a series of savvy business decisions eventually returned her to the screen, where she went on to star in nine films with the man who became the love of her life. The man, a notorious drunkard, was still married, and his Catholicism required that he remained married even as he and Hepburn spent the rest of their lives together. Their affair was an open secret, obvious to anyone who looked hard enough, but still ostensibly hidden from the rest of the world and it, along with tailored trousers, has come to define Hepburn's enduring star image. Prior to Hepburn's Hollywood stardom, her younger years and upbringing paved the way to her cinematic success. It would be difficult to find a more Yankee upbringing than Hepburn's. Born on 12th of May 1907 to a wealthy family, as the second of six children and the eldest daughter, Catherine Hepburn was raised in a comfortable and progressive setting in Hartford, Connecticut. She gained an insight into the suffragist movements from an early age through her mother's activism and protests, and this early introduction was influential and continued into her adulthood as she maintained strong feminist values. A daughter of a Connecticut urologist and suffragette, Hepburn was the second of six children and grew up doing all sorts of progressive things like helping lobby for birth control rights and being an all-around liberal hippie before the word even existed. As Hepburn later recalled, I learnt early what it is to be snubbed for a good cause. Hepburn's parents encouraged their children to cultivate their minds and bodies, and all the children played sports. Catherine took up golf, a sport she would play for the rest of her life, and a perfect opportunity 
for flagrant trouser wearing. Tragedy struck the Hepburn household when, just at 15 years old, the eldest child and Catherine's older brother, Tom Hepburn, took his own life. Close in age to her brother, they had also had a close relationship and consequently his death had a lasting impact on her. She secretly changed her birth date to his for many years and continued with a tomboy aesthetic and mannerisms into her later teenage years. I wanted to be independent, to separate myself from others and never again care so much about another person, so I would never feel the pain I felt when Tom left me. Hepburn was a force to behold. She was tall, athletic, pushy and, in the beginning, rather lacking in talent. After graduating from Bryn Mawr College, Hepburn signed with the RKO agency and was off to glamorous Hollywood, where, in the 1930s, sequins and feathers reigned supreme. RKO was determined to rebrand her image, which was often described as too masculine or too rough, to be cast as a leading lady. Director George Stevens, who worked with Hepburn in Alice Adams, told biographer Charles Hingham that she always thought that to play a love scene with a man involved standing up straight and talking to him strong eye to eye. This marked her first on-screen appearance, a breakthrough in the young actress's career, and it also became the first opportunity for a lasting insight into her early acting style. RKO had her screen test for A Bill of Divorcement with George Cooker. When Cooker saw her screen test, he knew there was something there. As he later recalled, there was this odd creature. She was unlike anybody I'd ever heard. He moved to cast her as the daughter of John Barrymore, yes, grandfather to Drew, but Hepburn, spitfire that she was, demanded $1,500 a week, an unheard of salary for a brand new, untested, odd bird of an actress. Cooker encouraged RKO to submit to her demands, and they agreed to short-term contract, just long enough to see if the film would float. A string of unsuccessful films also followed the failure of theatre production The Lake. The play had been directed inadequately by Jed Harris, and consequently Hepburn paid $14,000 of her own money to close down the production and free herself from his clutches. She would later recount Harris to be the most diabolical person she had ever met. Hepburn's image was ready. She was a leader and an independent woman, intelligent, vivacious and lacking the traditional beauty of peers, but secure in her decisions and the happiness they bought her. Publicity made a big deal out of Hepburn. Her attempts to exploit this star image over the next six years backfired, she played the titular character in Spitfire, a bold middle-class social climber in Alice Adams, and pulled off an amazing cross-dressing performance in Sylvia Scarlet, which has, in the years since its release, become a greatest hits go-to text for feminist and queer film theory. But as hilarious as audiences have long found men dressing as women, women cross-dressing is, ironically, more transgressive and, as such, unpopular. For many men, a woman cross-dressing is tantamount to a woman publicly declaring that she no longer needs to concern herself with being attractive to men, and that petrified men even more than a woman gaining the right to vote. To dress like a man was to disregard codes of femininity, to disregard those codes was to say screw you to patriarchy. Hepburn did this on and off screen, but she was never slovenly. She was just casually preppy, pulling off the sleek line. But the idea that Hepburn was sexless, or at least without sex appeal, began to gain traction. Which was interesting because at about this time Hepburn began a dalliance with one Howard Hughes, millionaire, debonair, man about town, burgeoning weirdo. The pivotal moment in Catherine Hepburn's career, when she was freed from the studio system and was able to pursue creative projects more independently. Taking a step back from film and Hollywood momentarily, Hepburn landed the role of Tracy Lord in The Philadelphia Story in 1939, a new play by Philip Barry. Seeing potential in the play, Howard Hughes bought the film rights prior to its opening night. And here's where it gets so good. After the play toured the US and became a must-see hit, 
Hepburn sold the rights for the film adaptation to Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, so long as she would reprise the lead role. Along with Hepburn's choice of director, George Cooker, she also chose her co-stars in the shapes of Cary Grant and James Stewart. Hepburn was very aware of how she wanted her Tracy character to be perceived by audiences, crafting and dictating the way in which her character's story would be told. Hepburn saw the film as a way to revive her acting career and increase her popularity with film fans once again. Hepburn knew that audiences were expecting more of the vintage Hepburn image, the very image that repelled them through the late thirties, so she focused on usurping expectations. Not only did she enter the film by falling flat on her back, literalising what most people wanted to happen to her, but she requested MGM's top costume designer, Adrian, to create a wardrobe that would combine the square silhouette, most associated with Joan Crawford, with a more glamorous cut. It was as if he were giving the Hepburn image soft edges, while making sure its vivacity and structure remained. The dresses and Hepburn in them are aces. Mirroring the difficulties Hepburn had in her relations with the press in the non-fiction version of events, her character's problems arising from her own temperament created a sympathy in the film's audience and thus helped to recreate Hepburn's public image. The film version of A Philadelphia Story was a monster hit. It gave Hepburn her third Academy Award nomination and her next project at MGM, Woman of the Year's Success, presented her with a fourth. As her co-star, she again wanted MGM star Spencer Tracy, a man she'd never met but whose work she admired. Hepburn also wanted a long-term contract, complete with approval of all stories, scripts and directors. MGM went for it, and just like that, box office Poison became one of the most powerful stars in Hollywood. The first of eight films together, Hepburn later remarked how their time together was absolute bliss, and while appearing in more films alongside Tracy, their romantic partnership remained a secret while their on-screen affairs blossomed. We just passed 27 years together in what was to me absolute bliss. While Tracy was separated from his estranged wife Louise Tracy and had been since the 1930s, he made no move towards divorce. Instead, Hepburn and Tracy kept their relationship concealed from his wife and lived in separate homes. Throughout Tracy's illness and final years, Hepburn was by his side and cared for him during the closing chapters of his life. But when he passed, she did not attend his funeral, primarily out of respect for his estranged wife. While only rumoured at the time, their relationship was not spoken about publicly by Hepburn until after both Tracy and Louise had died. Hepburn remained determined to continue both on stage and in cinema, so she bought out her contract from RKO, allowing her to freely move on to her next chapter in the hope of winning better favour with the public. The qualities that made Hepburn special were only amplified as she grew older. She was a brilliant screen comedian. She combined the eccentricity and mannerisms of the best character actors with a diva-like glamour and sex appeal. The arrogance that had so irked the RKO bosses began to seem a benefit. She was so far above the petty squabbling of the Hollywood studios that she wasn't bothered by the ebbs and flows in her popularity. Post-RKO, Hepburn was also one of the few stars able to control her own career. She was an astute businesswoman, albeit one whose negotiating tactics seemed to have been learnt in the nursery. She usually got anything she wanted because she would turn up wearing the traditional slacks, and she would barge into the studio boss's offices and give them hell. Hepburn picked the films she wanted to appear in and chose her co-stars, one reason why she worked so often with Spencer Tracy. They made a very engaging double act on screen and off. The hard-drinking Tracy was gruff and down-to-earth, while she remained flighty and mercurial. In their movies together, they always bickered furiously, and the more they argued, the more obvious their attraction for one another became. She appeared in 52 feature films, both for cinematic release and televised broadcast, in a career spanning over 60 years. 
The independent woman Hepburn represented on screen frequently represented her own lifestyle choices and she demonstrated a new possibility for women's place in society, the modern woman. Her style and star persona, personal opinions and on-screen performances all demonstrated the shift in women's position in society from the 1930s onwards. Hepburn's wardrobe choices and androgynous style set her apart from other actresses and typical glamour of the era, donning suits and trousers, cross-dressing at times and pushing the boundaries of her gendered appearance. Her feminist beliefs were made clear when she discussed patriarchal society structures, once noting that she never realised until lately that women were supposed to be the inferior sex, finding a woman's point of view much grander and finer than a man's. As a result of Catherine Hepburn's unique body of work, her monumental impact on cinema, fashion, culture and the representation of women in the media will be recognised and admired for many years to come. Over the course of her career, Hepburn transitioned from the plucky misfit to the arch-mother to the vinegary great-aunt, becoming, as people like to say about the ageing process, even more essentially herself. According to Hepburn, with age, even people who once thought her as shrewish gradually grew fond of me, like some old brick building. When Hepburn died in 2003 at the age of 96, it was not so much a single woman dying as it was the death of an age of female film stardom, an age when a woman with non-traditional beauty, a powerful voice and a disregard for Hollywood rules could be a major star for half a century. When Barbara Walters asked her if she even owned a skirt, she replied, I have one, Ms Walters, I'll wear it to your funeral. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Catherine Hepburn? Hollywood's newfound fashion influence propelled Hepburn into worldwide acclaim, and her tailored androgynous look became the embodiment of American style.